when you got some short pieces to cut off in the bandsaw here, like I got there, you always got to back it up. Another good use for the uh, the fireball tool shot blocks there, the magnetic shot blocks. We got a one, two, three block here, and a half inch thick block stuck to that to make up for the two and a half inch square. We're going to be chucking up and doing some machine work on a couple of square blocks like this. I've had some videos uh, quite a few years ago on uh, one way that you can indicate a piece of square stock. There's several different ways, but I want to show you another trick today that works really good. It's very effective. So we're going to go ahead and put this in there. And by the way, we've already set the jaws to two and a half just using a scale as close as we can using the reference lines right here. So we'll just go ahead and snug it up. I'm going to take you down into the table and show you what we're going to use. So this is my set of magnetic blocks from uh, Jason over Fireball Tool. Just different size, uh, standard thickness blocks that you can use to stack up uh, to different heights and you can use them for uh, an endless amount of uh, things around the shop, especially for fabrication work if you need to stack up a certain thickness. I've even got some of the uh, one, two, three blocks right here. Okay, but we're just going to use this for our indicating is what I was showing you. So I'm probably just going to grab, we're just going to use these four thinnest shims right here. And that's all we need. So let's go back over to the lathe with these guys here. So when you're indicating the you know, a square piece, what you want to do is, you know, go 180 out and you're usually what I would show is you come in here with your indicator in here and you rock it to find your uh, lowest, you know, spot, come off with your indicator, rotate it around, come back in and rock it and then split the difference and keep moving your jaws until you get it centered. So here's another way you can do this. You can take these magnetic blocks and let's stick them on all four sides, just right in the middle. And there is a couple little uh, magnets there. So what we'll do is, I'm just looking down there and just adjusting it so that, just so that the magnet is uh, not sticking out. All right. Now, this surface here on the inside is gonna be our reference surface that we're gonna be indicating. So instead of having to move your indicator off and rotating it, we're just going to come in here with an ID indicating attachment, indicate the ID of the square. So let me grab the indicator. This is my Starrett ID indicating attachment that just clamps right to a uh, standard indicator. So we'll come up in here and we're just going to get it very close like that. Uh, let me move you back just a touch. All right, we want it just real close like that. And let's go ahead and rotate it around. See, there's a... All right, there's a high right there. Tell you what, let's go ahead and I'm using the fine adjust at the bottom there. That's a little bit higher. And then there's a low, low, high, high. Okay, so I'm grab my chuck key, my chuck wrench, and we're going to loosen this one just a touch. We'll come around to the opposite side and snug that one up. Now let's look at it. So it's just touching. Let's come 180 out and you can see it's higher there. So let's bump it back a little bit more. Tighten that one up. All right, let's go to these two here. So that one's zero and that's low right there. So zeros are high. Let's loosen it, it's already loose there. So now we need to tighten up this one here. Now we're getting pretty close. Zero. That one's low. So one or two under zero. All right, so that's pretty close there. Let's check these. This one's a little bit low. So we got it within one, 
one thousandths right there. And keep in mind that the uh, the distance across the flats uh, may be different from side to side there. So you're going to get a little bit of a difference in the reading. So all you do, just like always, you just split the difference 180 out. So you focus on two points, get it close, rotate it to the next two points, and then get that. And just try to make those points 180 out the same. So we're well within a thousandths being uh, centered on this piece right here. Yep. So this is ready to machine now. So we can go ahead and just take our blocks off, move our indicator, we're ready to cut. Alright guys, so we got the fixture plate mounted up here on the shaper. It's ready to be put to work. So next phase of the project, what I'm going to do, I've got the Stoker engine outside here. We finally got uh, nice blue skies and cool air. It's not too hot. So I'm going to get out here. We're going to pick it up, just use my table, and I'll, I just want to get it cleaned up. So I'm going to do some wire brushing and uh, get this thing cleaned up. It's not bad. It's just surface rust here. And this was mostly from whenever I had brought it from uh, Lance's house to here it rained real heavy so it just got covered up in rain and uh, then I had it out I had it outside here covered up with a tarp and of course it's going to condensate and, and form rust there so I'm just going to go ahead and get it cleaned up good uh, before we take it inside and start doing our machine work all right so that's where we're at today
All right, so we brought the uh, stoker engine back in the shop here. I'm just using the uh, rolling gantry here, and uh, we're going to use that to uh, flip it back over upside down on its feet. It's just a lot easier to use this than that cherry picker outside, so that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. So we'll get it flipped over, take it back out there, finish cleaning all the outside and including the inside. We're going to get in there with our wire wheel and uh, try to clean as much as that surface rust out of there as we can, make it look nice and uh, hopefully a little bit more pretty than it is now with that rust in there and i just finished getting it nice and clean before we uh, bring it in here and start setting it up on the shaper there all right All right, here's a little better look down the inside of this thing. And uh, so these are the two channels that we're having to machine. These are the ones that were built up. So this is what we got to get in there. I need to go ahead and take all these square headed bolts out of here. And they've gotten pretty well seized up in there. I got one out. I got this one out right here, which was right there. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, use some of this good old CRC knocker loose. Spray on there and see if I can get it to penetrate a little bit. I'm just going to do some tapping like that on them just to try to shock them and try to um, you know break that rusted bond and I'm going to see if I can find a uh, proper star socket is what we used to always call them for uh, you know, square headed bolts. All right, we got all of them sprayed with a little knocker loose there. I was also gonna point out that um, I, I didn't realize I was down to my last two wire brushes for the air grinder here. And that's mainly what I'm gonna be using for the inside of this thing. Um, so I need to go and make an order, probably just use McMaster car, get me some more wire brushes coming. They should be here tomorrow. And if I don't get through it, all this cleaning, I'll be able to just finish it up tomorrow after the UPS guy shows up. I'm going to go ahead and give this another try here. See, it's pretty tight. <clears throat> Got pretty tight in here and I don't want to mess this stuff up. <clears throat> I need to find a socket and see if I can use my impact on that thing to help kind of shock them and get them to break loose. I don't really have the leverage. Ugh, that one broke loose right there. I don't have the leverage that I need to because I'm down here even with all of them. All right, it's the next day and the uh, UPS guy just dropped off my, uh, my new stuff right here. So picked up a few extra wire brushes just got all this from McMaster car so here is the uh, socket that I wanted to get so this is an eight point socket uh, it is a proto brand 5.8 square this is the one bolt that we got out of the engine right there and just uh, so you can see how it works so it's for a four point or a square drive but they just put two in there total making it an eight point so I'll get my impact out and we'll see if we can use this to get all the bolts out and not uh, round the corners off like it was trying to do right there all right, just got some more wire brushes for the air grinder. We got that style there. We got these. These work real good, too. And I got a couple more wire brushes. Uh, two different styles, because this one I haven't used before. This is just your standard knotted uh, cut brush right here. And then this one is a, like a more heavy-duty version of it. Look at this. It's actually got two rows of knotted wires in there. I believe this is the 20,000th diameter is what I picked. You can see the difference right there. So anyway, I just needed these anyway because I didn't have any more and these things eventually wear out. So now I can get back on my wire brushing and finish cleaning this thing out. Let's see if we can go ahead and get our uh, bolts out using the socket there. All right, we'll use the 
DeWalt 20 volt impact here with our new socket and I sprayed all the bolts three times yesterday with the knocker loose so hopefully that worked its way down in there and it's going to help let's see there we go like it's nothing to it I believe they were stuck in there I'm pretty sure that Keith and Lance had the bolts in there whenever they were doing all the welding to keep from the, getting any spray or powder down inside there. That one. All right, I'm going to have to file that corner off because I messed that one up with the alligator wrench. That one was a little tight right there. Man, having the right tools makes the job so much easier. I've gotten most of the inside of the, uh, let me take this mask down. I've gotten most of the inside of this clean. I could probably do a little bit more, but I pretty well got it. Um, I think I had mentioned before, this is something ideal whenever Keith goes to um, put it back together, finish the actual rebuild. I'm sure he's gonna soak this again as evapor rust, but even then it's still gonna need a good scrubbing and cleaning to get rid of the black oxide once, uh, once it converts it. But we got it clean. We've got all the loose scaly stuff out of there best I can. I've been cleaning these channels out. Honestly, I am very concerned about the integrity of the buildup that was put in here. And I'm not talking bad about Keith or Lance in any way. I'm just looking simply at the welds themselves. I think they tried to put some on the side, but I've got to go back and look at my notes and talk to Keith again because I cannot remember now if we were supposed to do anything with the sides of the channel there. I, I cannot remember, uh, but I think they tried to put a little weld on there because I can feel some pitting there on that side. But anyway, that wasn't even bonded. That's just flaking off as I'm wire brushing it right there. All right, and then I've got a, you can see a, right in here, there's a separation where it's kind of cracked in the material that was laid down. So I, I don't know if this is gonna work or not. We're probably still gonna go through the work and the motions of getting it set up, getting in here and cutting it to see what it's doing. But I think there's a high probability that we're going to have to uh, either re-weld it or come up with another way to fix this. And I'm, I don't know yet. I'm just speculating right now. I'm just showing you what I'm seeing as I'm cleaning this up. 
and uh, you know we may have a lot of work still to do on this thing as we as we move forward it's not a rush job there's no deadline this is a total volunteer job that everybody is doing on this this is not a paid job and nobody's nobody's uh, charging for any of this work here so we're just kind of doing this as we can and uh, I think that's about it I'm gonna go ahead and get everything cleaned up and start working on getting this put back in the shop I've got rain coming tomorrow so I definitely don't want it to get rained on again and uh, I'm gonna get this back in the shop and uh, from here we're probably gonna go ahead and start trying to get it set up in the shaper and uh, get it indicated all right, we got her all cleaned up. Let's go ahead and pick this engine up and set it on the fixture plate in the shaper there and show you guys what this is going to look like as a final setup uh, before we get started on the actual machine work there. We did bring the ram all the way back. I even took the lantern tool out of here just to give me some extra clearance. And it looks like we're right about where it needs to be, right here. You have to kind of hold it where you want it because when you pull the chain, it moves it around. And we have touchdown. I feel just a slight amount of rock. I'll have to use some uh, feeler gauges and figure out how much uh, shim we're going to need. We need to shim one, one side of that so we're not twisting it when we pull it down. This is going to be the hardware that I'm using to hold it. Some three-quarter studs and the flange nuts there. So it looks like all of our holes are going to be lining up just perfectly with plenty of room to kind of you know, twist it around a little bit as we need to get it aligned. This isn't going to be a final setup. This is just a mock-up so that we can uh, see what it's going to look like and everything's going to work. Again, we're going to have to do a little shimming because I can feel it. Either this foot here or the front foot whichever one we'll have to cut a shim to put in there because it is slightly off and it could be the plate or it could be the um, the you know the the wear in the bottom of the material there all right let's get the other side that's looking good right there all right yeah it's looking like all of our holes are lining up just like we need here happy to see this finally come together like this looking good well there she is mounted up ready for the machine work to start of course again this is just a mock-up we're not ready yet we gotta we gotta get it mounted in here properly and then we'll we will be using these machined surfaces here to do our indicating and before when I was talking about you know not having a machine that's completely flat 
we're going to be using the universal table as we need hopefully we're not going to have to rotate it this way but maybe use our tilt feature but whatever we got to do we're going to be using that universal table there to make sure that our machine faces in here are perfectly aligned to how they were machined so we should be able to use this these faces here to get it trammed in parallel to the stroke of the ram and then if we need to align it so that this way is completely flat then that's where we'll use this part of the table here to rotate it however we need here's our clearance up at the front near the column and it's right where i had uh, wanted it to be i was going to give myself about three inches of clearance and you can see we've got about three inches of clearance right there so that worked out pretty good it's all coming together next phase is to really start getting it indicated getting it true and then of course we're going to do our our machine work down here into the welds that were put in there and i did i did check everything my tool is going to work to get down in there and do that cutting my only worry is that uh you know using the the high speed tool to do the cutting i don't know how well it's going to work on that because every time i've tried using carbide on this style of uh tool that i use it chips the carbide so i don't know if i'm going to be using carbide for that either but we'll see it's going to be a it's going to be one of those situations where we're just going to see how it works out and do what we can to get the job done i will point out this guy right here this is your uh you know crankshaft journal right here and i did some measuring on this guy for keith because the crankshaft is another part that's getting done and he's got it at a crankshaft shop somewhere up in Georgia, I believe, that's got to get it ground. But uh, this guy has a little bit of wear in it too, so this could be something that you guys might see done in the future. But I'm, I'm going to assume Keith is going to tackle this job, maybe on his new horizontal bore mill when he gets it up and running. But I'm thinking that this needs to be removed, the two bearing halves. and. Um, or either bore it I, I really don't know how he wants to tackle that but i just know that this is going to have to be uh worked on right here get this round this bearing journal here i think that's about it so what i wanted to mention about this job is that i'm going to have to take a uh, short break on this but i got accomplished what i was wanting to i wanted to get the fixture plate done and get it in here and make sure that this is going to work so we made it this far we're going to make a little pause on it because I got some other jobs in here that I need to get done. I've had other jobs come up that people have asked me, could I please help them get done? And I've accepted these jobs, but we got a little bit of a time crunch there, a time period I need to get this stuff, other stuff done. So we're going to be working on some other projects in between that. And I hope to get those done soon. And as soon as I get those projects done, that's when we'll come back over here and we'll start working on the Stoker engine again. Okay. So over the weekend, I received an email from a gentleman named Trent Potter. And Trent and his brother Heath, they're shoe cobblers and they have a shoe repair business. And uh, they have a business there, it's called pottersandsons.com and they have a YouTube channel as well. It's called Trenton and Heath. And I would uh, encourage you to go check out their YouTube channel. It's, it's great. They, uh, they have awesome videos on their craft of repairing shoes and boots and resoling boots and uh, how to polish them, how to clean them. A lot of neat stuff out there. And I actually was not aware about their channel. I didn't even know they existed until, you know, Trent contacted me. So one of our viewers actually sent them an email and said, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware of A-Bomb 79, but he's got some work boots that look like they could, you know, have a little work done to them. So Trent reached out to me, said who he was, and that he, you know one of our viewers put him in contact with me and uh, said that he would love to work with me. And so I took a couple pictures of my boots, sent them up there to Trent, emailed him, and he responded and said, yeah, I think we can fix you up there. So I'm getting ready to box these guys up and send them up there, but I wanted to get some video showing you, you know, what these look like before I send them. And then uh, once Trent gets them, he's going to work his magic on these boots and, and hopefully get them back into great working condition again so that I can continue to use them and put some more miles on them. 
but be sure to check out their website. They got all their info on there, uh, pottersandsons.com. They've got an Instagram as well, and they make some great videos, and I've enjoyed watching a few of them here recently since his email. They've got a couple of recent videos on repairing work boots. One is a Thorogood mock, uh, mock toe, and um, the, other one, the other boot was a Red Wing that they repaired. So I'm getting ready to send these up there. I'm going to get you in a little closer so we can take a closer look of what kind of condition these boots are in before I send them. So I thought I would also mention I've got my other ones here. I've been wearing Thoroughgoods for quite a while now. So these are the ones that I'm going to start wearing once I send the slip-ons up there to Trent. So these are my other Thoroughgoods, and these are the lace-up considered. Uh, these are called mock toes. And I actually had these resold here in town. The, uh, the place where I buy my boots, they, uh, they have a guy there that, that resoles boots as well. So once I wore the soles out on these, I went in and uh, bought these boots and then found out that they resole. So I dropped these off and had them resole them. And I've, wear, I've worn them some, not a lot, but I don't like them as much as the uh, slip-on. I've always liked slip-on boots. And the reason why I went with the mock toe whenever I bought these is I wanted to get something that had more uh, ankle support by the, you know, lacing them up tight. And while these are very comfortable and awesome work boots, I just like my slip-ons. I like just being able to step into them, pull them on, and, and be done with it. The other, the other thing that I like about slip-ons is that when you're doing a lot of welding and torching, you know, you don't get all that slag and you're not burning up your laces, you know, because they don't have any. So that's the other benefit I like about slip-ons. So anyway, I was just going to show you. I'm going to wear these while Trent is working his magic on the slip-ons there. So let me pull you in a little tighter and let's get a little video of what these look like before they get fixed. All right, so here is a little closer shot. We'll just start with this one right here of my um, thorough good slip-ons right there. And you can easily see the wear in the soles there. I've just about got these things wore out. We're uh, right here, it looks like we're getting into the, I believe that's the midsole right there, if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong, but it is getting into that material there. You can kind of see my, you know, my walking pattern and how I put the weight on my foot whenever I walk, so it's thinned over on that side and back here quite a bit. Still a big chip stuck in the, uh, the boot right there. So the uh, left boot is kind of the kind of the same story there. Just about get into the the midsole right there. A lot of wear on the inside and in the back corner right there as well. But the leather itself is still in pretty good shape. I don't I don't normally wear out the uh, the front so much. Like uh, a lot of guys in construction, they're down there. You know on their feet and their knees a lot bending down and uh, I don't do that so much with these boots here so I think they still got a lot of life left on them and I know Trent will probably clean them and recondition the leather and uh, get them looking a little bit better again because I saw him do that on the uh, on those other boots there so there we go that's what my current work boots look like I do like wearing thoroughgood boots I think they're a good quality boot they are made in USA up in Wisconsin and uh, before I started buying Thoroughgoods several years ago, I was always buying cheap boots and uh, wearing those, and you know they would last maybe six months or so. But I just I really do like Thoroughgood boots, and this is what I prefer to wear. So it's going to be great getting them fixed up, and I look forward to seeing what Trent does on the repair for these. That's going to be really cool. So once we get these guys back. I will show you what they look like, and I will, of course, share the uh, the link to uh, Trent's video on doing the uh, the boot repair. All right.